<laughs> so uh, my name is John Donahue. I'm a professor here at Stanford Law School, and we would like to thank our sponsors, which does include Stanford Law School, Stanford in Government, and the League of Women Voters uh, Gun Safety Committee. So thank you to our sponsors. Um, and I did have a couple of quick announcements. I was told to mention that for those who are getting uh, uh, continuing legal education credit, there are certificates outside that you should pick up. Uh, and I was also apprised that the uh, uh, women's restroom is on the second floor. Uh, so men's is right outside. I knew that one. Um, OK, so um, I thought I would uh, start out with a, a few brief uh, comments, and after I'm done, I'll introduce our panelists in order. Uh, it turns out that uh, today, tonight's discussion is a part of the overall picture in the United States involving gun violence. And as you will get a sense as the evening goes by, there, there are many different dimensions to gun violence problems in the United States, and uh, nothing is easily solved. We're in a world of about 40,000 deaths from gunshots in the United States. Um, and uh, that's the most that we've had in half a century. And a great deal of the increase in those deaths is driven by the increase in suicides. Uh, we also have uh, close to 16,000 gun homicides. Uh, for comparison, uh, Japan had one last year, one gun homicide in the entire nation. Um, so we're not doing as well as some countries in this regard. Uh, and uh, uh, the homicides, again, fall into many different and discrete categories, everything from domestic violence to street gun crime uh, to mass shootings, which obviously capture a lot of the public uh, interest, even though a small portion of the overall gun deaths. And then about 2,000 gun accidents. Um, so just to give a sense of, of where the increasingly bad problems are, uh, mass shootings are on the rise. Uh, in 2017, it was the largest number ever recorded by the FBI in terms of active shooter incidents. And you can see the uh, FBI documented upward trend since the end of the federal assault weapon ban in 2004. Um, and uh, the May of 2018 Santa Fe, Texas uh, school shooting uh, was the uh, first time in history that we had had over a 12-month period in the United States four mass shootings in which uh, more than 10 individuals were killed per incident. Uh, so there are some troubling trends on the mass shooting front, uh, and I mentioned on the suicide front. Uh, and turning to the topic of today, uh, this was really initiated as a legal issue uh, going back to 1998 in Connecticut when a, an accountant at the Connecticut Lottery gunned down four of his bosses before killing himself. Um, and he had had a number of problems that people had recognized uh, in terms of anger and depression. Um, and the police had visited his apartment because he had been seen holding a knife to his throat. And Connecticut at that time passed a law allowing judges to issue an order enabling law enforcement to confiscate weapons. So this is what we're uh, talking about today, the so-called red flag laws. But the Connecticut law did not um, gain a lot of currency around the country immediately. And it really has been the mass shootings of recent years. And of course, uh, it was just this week a year ago that the Parkland shooting occurred. Uh, and that has given a, a pretty strong impetus for more of these laws. Uh, now, of course, uh, one of the things that is necessary to implement these laws is that the people around uh, a person who may be in danger uh, to himself or others uh, recognizes the danger and takes action. This is the gun that uh, you may recall Adam Lanza used in the Sandy hook killing. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, despite his severe uh, mental illness, and he had been burning himself with cigarettes in the year prior to this episode, his mother uh, made an array of guns, including the Bushmaster assault rifle you just saw a picture of, available to him. And so he killed her and then went off to Sandy Hook uh, with that weapon and a handgun. 
and uh, committed mass murder. Uh, and his mother had actually intended to give Adam another gun, uh, but she was killed uh, shortly before Christmas in 2012. Um, so this is one of the problems in the US where there's not always a recognition of the problem as to where the danger lies. Uh, Nancy Lanza felt that by having a lot of assault weapons, she was making her, her family safer. Um, so Maryland was among the states that adopted a red flag law after the Parkland slaughter. And in the three months after that law took effect in October 1, 2018, they seized 148 uh, guns or, or guns from 148 individuals. And um, the Montgomery County Sheriff uh, indicated that in four of those episodes, there were significant threats to schools. Uh, and he indicated this, these orders are not only being used appropriately, but they are saving lives. So California has now uh, uh, adopted one of these laws after a, another mass shooting event a few years ago. And um, uh, luckily, man, many if not all of the mass shooters uh, do provide some obvious warnings that there's a danger and if the public is aware and takes action, uh, we may be able to uh, stop some of these episodes. So let's hear from our panel today. And I'll start off uh, uh, to my left is Julia Weber. Uh, she's at the Giffords Law Center, where she is a fellow focused on gun violence restraining order implementation efforts. Uh, she's an expert on domestic violence policy and has spent her career working to develop and implement practices to prevent and respond to violence. Uh, she has the uh, uh, rather wonderful combination of both being a lawyer and a social worker, uh, and is uh, also an adjunct professor at Golden Gate School of Law where she teaches domestic violence. I'll turn it over to Julia. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me just give me one moment to get us organized here, and uh, we'll start. Okay, phew, that went smoothly. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and thank you all for being here today. Um, I, as was already mentioned, I uh, work at Giffords Law Center. Uh, I'm in a 12-month fellowship, just started in November. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense of what uh, Giffords does, I'll be talking a little bit about sort of how I personally got here because it relates in large part to the development of the gun violence restraining order law in California. I became very interested in um, the position of implementation fellow because I was at the Judicial Council, which is the policy making body for our state court system here. Um, California has the largest court system in the country and by some estimates the world. And we have 800 uh, staff people who work on policy making for our state court system. And it's a pretty um, little known area of legal uh, development, law and policy development. Uh, so I'll be talking about that because when the GVRO law, the gun violence restraining law, uh, was rolled out, the courts uh, had to work on figuring out how to implement it. And things did not go um, as I'm sure many hoped. And so when I saw this opportunity to work on implementation, uh, with that background, um, I had already left the Judicial Council after 17 and a half years. I thought, well, this will be fun. This will be really interesting. That's the kind of fun I like to have, is uh, <laughs> um, taking on difficult policy work. Um, so uh, Giffords uh, Law Center, so there's Giffords and there's Giffords Law Center. And um, in 1993, the, what, what became the Law Center was uh, established after the 101 California shooting, the mass shooting in San Francisco. And a group of lawyers formed what became the Law Center and then um, after Congresswoman Gabby Giffords uh, was shot uh, in Tucson, she subsequently, um, along with her husband Mark Kelly, uh, started the Americans for Responsible Solutions organization. And then in 2016, the organizations merged. So uh, Giffords Law Center um, has a very extensive website, sort of the encyclopedia of gun violence prevention laws for uh, nationally. Uh, we do a scorecard uh, where you can go state by state and look at why um, California might have an A or an A plus and another uh, state might have a D minus or an F and so forth. Um, so if you're looking for information about uh, the legal framework, both here in California uh, and around the country, I encourage you to take a look at the Giffords Law Center uh, website. Um, 
So I, it, uh, just, we've already sort of touched on this um, idea, but I want to just sort of set the framework for why it is that we even looked at developing a gun violence restraining law here in California. And certainly mass shootings get um, a lot of attention. And um, there's a lot of uh, grassroots organizing that often happens after those uh, tragedies, um, and for very good reason. And on top of it, we know that um, hopefully, well, it's not, it's not coming across quite as clearly as the graphic provides, but you see that there's a website there that I encourage you to check out. Um, UC Davis is uh, gun violence prevention. Um, the folks in the public health uh, field have developed a new website. Um, what you could do or what, what you can do about gun violence prevention. And we'll hear more about sort of the public health angle of this um, in a bit. But um, there's extensive research, obviously, about the uh, extent to which uh, people are dying as a result of firearms being present when uh, around suicide, uh, mass shootings, of course, domestic violence. Um, and uh, you can see here some accidental, um, but firearms killed more than 38,000 people. Um, and the numbers up there from 2016, 2017. Um, in California specifically, we believe about 14% of Californians own firearms. 54% um, of those who own firearms own uh, more one or two, but then 10% own 10 or more firearms. So um, that's about roughly half of all civilian-owned firearms in California are owned by about 10%. Um, 25% of California adults live in households with firearms, and 40% of these include children 12 and younger. So we know firearms are present in our community. Um, we also know there are ways to be responsible and safe with firearms. And the policy efforts that we undertake at uh, Giffords Law Center and uh, other organizations undertake, um, I believe, are really designed to try and address where it is we can be more responsible. And the gun violence restraining order is one of those tools to uh, really focus on prevention. Um, so I um, provided a handout for you uh, that is really addresses what I would like to spend a little bit of time focusing on. I'm going to go into what the gun violence restraining order does in a moment. Uh, but because my focus has been working on domestic violence uh, for a long time, uh, when the gun violence restraining order law was introduced, a lot of us said, why do we need this, right? We have a variety of ways of preventing people from accessing firearms when they are a danger to themselves and to others. Um, and, you know, where does this fit in? And I think um, one of the issues that I want to make sure to convey today is the range of options uh, within the civil framework we have both criminal approaches, and I know we have law students and attorneys in the room, and probably I imagine some non-lawyers and not attorneys in the room, uh, uh, not people who never went to law school or aren't in law school now. So um, the, there's an enormous difference between what happens in criminal proceedings and civil proceedings. Uh, and in the civil restraining, like a lot of people I talk to think domestic violence, which involves generally behavior that could be considered criminal, is largely handled in the criminal courts. And I think you probably agree, there's some segment of domestic violence behavior that is handled in the criminal courts, but with the advent of the civil restraining order process, a significant amount, I'd say the majority of allegations around domestic violence are handled in civil proceedings. And that means it's uh, two people, you know, a member of the public who goes and asks for a restraining order against another member of the public, um, and law enforcement has very limited involvement. In a domestic violence context, and you can see this on your page that says uh, civil restraining orders uh, um, in California, domestic violence emergency protective order, EPO 001. I don't want to say we're like the IRS because that doesn't mm -hmm. make anybody happy, but there, it is kind of similar in the sense the Judicial Council creates forms and they have numbers. And so when you work in the field, you can throw around things like EPO 001, and people generally know what you're talking about, right? Yes. So EPO 001 has been around for a long time. It's an emergency protective order for gun uh, for uh, domestic violence, right? And that is only um, something that only a law enforcement officer can get. It's an emergency situation. They would call up the on-duty judge 
um, and say that there's a situation in which somebody needs to be protected. It's an individual who needs to be protected and someone else who needs to be restrained. That's only going to last for five days. Um, and then after that, if the individual who might be at risk needs ongoing protection from a dangerous person, they're going to need to go to court to pursue that restraining order, a temporary or ex parte restraining order. Um, and then there would be a third process called the order after hearing or sometimes a permanent order, although nothing is really permanent or not too often is it permanent. Um, so it's a situation in which, yes, um, uh, law enforcement would be involved at the, at the beginning, but they're not going to go to the hearing. They're not going to go back in and ask for that ex parte order that will last for two to three weeks or so or for the order that might last for five years in a domestic violence context. That is also true in civil harassment orders, uh, workplace violence orders, elder abuse orders, a range of uh, restraining order remedies that include firearms restrictions. So you can see, um, we've sort of put this in the U. Uh, this is a, a chart that's been used by many self-help centers around the state to try and assist people as they navigate what kind of restraining order would make sense for me. This chart, historically didn't have gun violence restraining orders on it, and most of them still don't. Because gun violence restraining orders are so infrequently used, you might go to a self-help center and say, I'm afraid or I'm concerned, and you'll likely hear about DV orders and the others that I mentioned, civil harassment, workplace, elder abuse. Okay? Um, there's a whole other line of uh, re or restraining order in the criminal context and prohibitions as a result of criminal cases as well, and this chart doesn't go into that. So, and, and there are even additional ways of prohibiting people in the criminal context, and for lots of reasons. The Judicial Council um, puts out a about 28-page guide for judges on all the different ways people might be prohibited um, in terms of firearms, okay? So the gun violence restraining order fits into this context of we already have uh, firearms restrictions in place in civil restraining order proceedings, um, but there was something missing. And... Um, we additionally have firearms restrictions under Welfare and Institutions Code Section 5150. Um, and under 5150, that's, you know, you might hear that used more casually as somebody was 5150. Um, this is about being psychiatric, uh, psychiatrically evaluated and put um, in a facility. Um, there may be a hold as a result of someone being um, adjudicated or identified as mentally ill, and there's a whole process for that to happen, which I've also outlined here on the handout. Um, so, and we can get more into this as we go. But, um, so, you know, in California, basically, we have a robust set of laws designed to address situations in which somebody is dangerous to themselves or dangerous to others. And we have ways of protecting people, but we still had some gaps. And Isla Vista, um, the shooting at Santa Barbara, was um, one of those moments where the family of the young man who went ahead and committed the mass tragedy at UC Santa Barbara at Isla Vista um, had firearms, his family was concerned, and they were not able to meet the threshold for the 5150 approach, um, and no restraining order really fit that situation. Even though there are, again, as the chart points out, firearms restrictions in each of these categories. And I want to emphasize that because sometimes I think the gun violence restraining order is talked about as the only or the first way that we've ever restricted firearms in a civil context. And I think that's dangerous. Um, there are situations in which um, a family member, for example, uh, somebody, a married couple, um, who's concerned, uh, where the individual is concerned about um, abuse or harassment and firearms, it takes a certain amount of planning. Usually I'd recommend with an advocate or an attorney or a social service provider or shelter to really think through how does a, obtaining any kind of restraining order fit in with a general safety plan. And when we don't do that, we run the risk of um, actually increasing the dangerousness for that individual. And so there are times where a domestic violence victim may say, I don't want to go get a restraining order, and there are firearms present, and we might say, that's a good time for a gun violence restraining order. And that may be the case. But we need to make sure, and you know, those of us up here on the panel and who are doing this work are really trying to make sure that law enforcement and other service providers 
who um, come into direct contact with people who may have to make these kinds of choices have all of the information and have all of the tools available. Um, and so the more we can understand what the different options are, I think we're in a better position to pursue civil or criminal approaches depending on the situation. So the GVRO, um, just to provide some definitional context here, um, allows law enforcement or immediate family members, which include household members or people who have resided in the house uh, within the last six months. So it's a sort of a, a broader definition of family than you might uh, think of immediately. And it is what built on a similar approach, although um, a little bit different in Connecticut, um, in California was the first to expand it to allow family members to also pursue a gun violence restraining order. Okay? But the civil aspect of it's important and sometimes confusing because it's located in the penal code. So it's a restraining order uh, that's civil, but it's in a different part. We don't usually have our civil restraining orders in the penal code. So um, we can talk about that too. All right. Um, so the Judicial Council is a really important part of the implementation of the gun violence restraining orders. Um, the Judicial Council is responsible for developing the forms. We have a forms-based system in California. Um, some think that's overwhelming. And again, looking at the stacks of forms and, oh my goodness, the packet is so huge. How are we going to implement all these? How are we going to fill these out? In systems or court systems that don't have forms, you're, gonna, you're looking at blank pieces of paper or having to consult with an attorney. So the idea in California is that this can make restraining orders in particular much more accessible to the public. And the um, Judicial Council not only does forms and rules of court, which have the force of law. Um, we have two rules of court in um, California that uh, dictate how the court is supposed to handle firearms relinquishment in domestic violence cases not in gun violence restraining order cases yet, um, but it's something to be thinking about. When the statutory framework doesn't lend itself easily to court administration procedures, uh, rules of court can be very helpful. And the judicial branch has that authority under our Constitution to make rules of court that say, courts, this is what you must do. And it really is the only way we can hope for statewide consistency in the 58 counties. Okay. They also um, run the, um, develop and publish the uh, self-help website. And that's where you'll find more information on gun violence restraining orders. So I put that up there. If you go to courts.ca.gov and you look at the self-help website, which is also available in Spanish, then um, you will find information similar to this chart that says, here's what you need to do. Here are the steps you need to take. Here are the forms you need to fill out. And you'll always have the most up-to-date forms the most up-to-date rules. Um, it's a little confusing because as you can see, where's the gun violence restraining order uh, information located? Under abuse and harassment because that's what we generally think about with restraining orders. And the gun violence restraining order doesn't address abuse and harassment at all. It removes firearms. And that's it, that's significant. That's not to diminish its significance, but a domestic violence restraining order, for example, has over 30 remedies um, child support, spousal support, child custody and visitation, pets. You can write your pets into your um, the domestic violence restraining order, um, cell phone uh, contracts and telephone numbers, a, a bunch of different things. So it's important to just understand there may be remedies that are necessary that aren't as available. Um, so again, we can talk more about that. Um, just quickly, the uh, uh, Judicial Council forms um, this. Uh, looks very normal now because um, this has been around for a while, this format, it's plain language. If you look at um, older forms or forms in other case types, they look, you know, lots of capital letters, lots of teeny tiny capital letters that look like traditional legal forms. We have what's called plain languaged, all of the restraining order forms to make them um, more accessible to people as well. And they'll be referred to by GV100 and so forth. Um, so some of that information is on this chart, uh, and it's all available on the website. Okay, there are the um, uh, gun violence restraining order forms are also available in multiple languages, the top languages in California. So they've been translated. They can't be submitted that way, but they can be um, read so that people who, for whom English is not their primary language can have a sense of um, what they need to do or are expected to do with a gun violence restraining order. 
All right, this is an important piece of implementation. Um, and now let's just get into this a little bit. Um, immediate family members as defined, uh, we're talking about the spouse, domestic partner, um, the longer list, as well as the immediate, or, um, uh, the immediate family and the household members, anyone who re regularly resides in the household or within the last six months has resided in the household. Um, law enforcement, which the Judicial Council website says very clearly, it's a better idea to talk to law enforcement about getting a gun violence restraining order than going ahead and getting it yourself. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that. While it is very, um, uh, I, I, it, it was an improvement or an advance to be able to allow family members to get them, it is not necessarily a best practice. Um, we, you know, in California, we want that to be available in case you don't want to go to law enforcement, and we can have a lengthy conversation about the pros and cons. But the dangerousness of these situations often warrant law enforcement involvement. And so not only in terms of obtaining it, but also in serving the order. And I know Marissa is going to talk about that. One of the complexities here is how you get that order served so it can be followed um, and those guns can be relinquished, surrendered, seized um, at the scene or soon thereafter. Um, so, and one of the challenges is how does law enforcement get that information? So they need to have some personal knowledge um, or because someone else has contacted them, but then they need someone like Marissa or a city attorney or someone else to help them navigate the legal process. Because one of the things that makes the gun violence restraining order um, different is that you have law enforcement uh, getting the EPO002, which is in that second column there on your sheet. Um, and then after that, there's an automatic setting now of the hearing for a gun violence restraining order that's going to last uh, until the next, it, it could last up to a year, right? So you're talking of, and they can also get the second and third part um, aspects of the gun violence restraining order, which I'll talk about in a minute. The emergency protective order or the emergency, uh, the EPO002, they can get it after hours or in most jurisdictions during the day. They should be able to um, any time. The hearing will be automatically set afterwards. So Marissa is going to get more into some of the specifics of that. But that's the first type, EPO002, an emergency order only for law enforcement. All right. Then we have a temporary order. You would use GV110 for that. Um, and in there, family members all, or law enforcement can ask for the temporary order. And it will last for, the hearing will need to be set um, within the 21 days. And then um, the, that's when you're looking at the third type of restraining order, which would be a one year GV100, GV130 would be used. We sometimes refer to it as an order after hearing. You'll also see between the statutory framework, the forms, which used to be called firearms instead of gun violence restraining order, the nomenclature varies. So you hear about temporary emergency protective orders, you hear about ex parte temporary orders, you hear about one year orders. But basically there are three. EPO002 just for law enforcement, the um, temporary or ex parte order that you can get without the other party by going into court um, and making the um, allegations that need to be made, um, or the third, the order after hearing, okay? I know I'm rushing through this because uh, we all just have a little bit of time. So um, the gun relinquishment process, um, I think I'm going to leave that to you because you're going to talk more about that, right, Marissa? Yes. Yeah, exactly how they go through that. Renewals and termination. So they last up to a year, um, at which point they could be renewed. You can go in and make a, uh, the argument that the um, restraining order needs to be renewed. They also have one opportunity during the year that it's in place, if you're the restrained party, to go in and request that it be terminated. Okay, so there's provisions there to keep it um, longer um, or to end it earlier, all right? The courts are expected to be performing um, what are called 6306 background checks on the parties uh, when they issue the orders and also when there's a request to terminate the order. The 6306 background check is under Family Code Section 6306 to look at any other criminal, relevant criminal history as listed in the statute. And there are provisions there for that information to be provided to the um, restrained person so they have an opportunity to be heard, so due process is respected, um, and for uh, that information to be kept confidential in the 
civil file because an important aspect of this to remember is that these are public cases um, often and hopefully with a confidential section in the file but these are not uh, private or um, sealed records uh, and again we can talk a little bit more about that when these orders are um, issued they need to be entered into the statewide database uh, the court needs to be issuing them or law enforcement not all courts um, enter into the statewide database and then they would be uploaded to the national criminal database as well um, but there should be a record because in, we now have CLETS, a new CLETS form. CLETS is the California Law Enforcement Technology System where these records of all restraining orders are maintained so that if you were to run a check, you'd be able to see whether or not somebody had a restraining order, okay? So that's an important part of the process too, okay? And I think that's it. I'm um, happy to answer questions. I think we're gonna do that all at the end maybe. Uh, my email is up there. Like I said, I'm spending this year uh, implementing and working with people who are already implementing and happy to uh, be of assistance where I can. So thank you. Can you help me get to yes, that? I'm going to help you get to you. Hi, everybody. Well, l l l let me just introduce you, Marissa, while you're, you're <laughs> setting so up. So, you know, uh, so Marissa is the supervising deputy district attorney at Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office. She heads the newly formed Crime Strategy Unit and is one of the state's leading experts on the restraining orders. Uh, she's been working since 2016 to raise awareness among law enforcement agencies about California's GVRO and its potential to help stop gun crime before it's been committed. So Marissa, take it away. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here talking about this issue because um, as a district attorney, I work very closely with the police. And when I first learned about gun violence restraining orders, quite embarrassingly, there's, uh, this has now been quoted in a couple newspaper articles, so I'll talk about it openly, but the first time I ever learned about this was in what I describe as a hot call. I got a call from a police officer. I was working as a supervisor over our violent felony unit, and a cop called me to say, Marissa, we got to get one of those gun violence things. I've got a guy who's on his way up here from San Juan Batista. He's got a trunk full of guns, and he says he's going to shoot a bunch of cops. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. What gun thing? He says, gun violence restraining orders. He's like, I got to go. Google it. And he hangs up. <laughs> this is real. This actually happened. So um, I said, I've never heard of this. It's 2016. I do Google it. I find it online, and we end up initiating a gun violence restraining order. I'll talk about that case example in a minute. Uh, but that's not the way you want to go into one of these. <laughs> that's not, it's not best practice. Um, so I, um, in order to save embarrassment and a uh, future experience like that, I educated myself, and I've been educating law enforcement ever since. Last year, I spoke to over 1,000 police officers about gun violence restraining orders and have really been pounding the pavement to talk to community groups now. Um, I wanted to make sure that the police officers knew what they were doing before you all started um, contacting them potentially to use this tool. Um, so I'm really happy, um, thank you very much to hosting this event so that we can really talk about why are we not using this tool? Um, these statistics were uh, put together by the Department of Justice and then published by the Sacramento Bee last year which highlighted the fact that since its passage, and I know you can't read this, so I'm gonna summarize it for you super quickly. Um, the tool was very rarely used in 2016 and 2017. In fact, the state leader at the time in 2017 was Los Angeles with a grand total of 16 gun violence restraining orders. Not good enough. Look at Santa Clara County. This is my stomping grounds. In 2017, we did four gun violence restraining orders. So when I took over in my new assignment um, at the Crime Strategies Unit, I'm now an official law enforcement liaison, and we started a gun um, education campaign. Um, specifically, I'm tasked with looking at um, data-driven approaches and evidence-based solutions to reducing gun violence. So this was right in my lane. Um, and the reason for that is, and we'll do a, a little a quick ask of the audience, how, um, you may be familiar um, with the number of homicides that we had in San Jose over the last few years. It usually is about 30 on average. Last year we had 27. But does anybody know how many aggravated assaults with a firearm were reported in San Jose? And just to quickly define that, that means shooting at a human. How many cases were reported in the city of San Jose involving aggravated assault with a firearm in 2017? Any guesses? 
Can we guess this side of the room? 200? That's a good guess. 502. Yeah. That's right. Just so you know, when I asked this same question of a group of police officers who worked for the department, they also guessed about one or 200. That was actually too true in 20, uh, 2010, but it is no longer true. In fact, firearms with an uh, aggravated assault with a firearm have doubled in the city of San Jose in the last 10 years, and the graph is a straight line up. Um, last year, uh, violent crime was up again by double digits in the city of San Jose. And so this is um, now an issue with some personal urgency for me. And so gun violence restraining orders are a very um, common sense tool to fill a gap that existed in our county. And I'm proud to report that last year we did 33. Woo! Um, so we're very happy. And, and of course, you know, I was mad about this because I spoke to literally over 600 police officers at San Jose PD and they only did eight. You know I was angry about that. So we can do better. And um, part of that is because actually doing them is quite challenging. So I'm going to talk about our real life experience. So what is required for an emergency gun violence restraining order? Just really quickly, the legal standard is that you must show that there's reasonable cause that the subject is an immediate and present danger of causing personal injury to self or others by having guns and ammunition and Obtaining the order is necessary to protect injury because other means have been tried or are inappropriate. So really, this is a familiar standard to police officers, danger to self or others. That's the same basic standard in a 5150 call that uh, Julia referred to earlier under the Welfare and Institutions Code. So danger to self or others is already something that they're thinking of. So this was really easy for me to train the police to say, all right, when you're going out and you have a situation where somebody is a danger to self or others of harming someone now with a gun, I want you to be thinking of a GVRO in all 5150 calls, and we'll talk about why, but also be thinking of it in the categories that we are now unfortunately seeing with more frequency. School shooter threats. Had one last night. We're going to talk about it. Um, happens, unfortunately, all the time. And in fact, in the weeks following Parkland last year, Every single jurisdiction with whom I work experienced a copycat school shooter threat in all 14 jurisdictions that I work with in my, uh, my role. So um, that's not good. So I want them to be thinking of this as a tool. We also want to be using it with suicide prevention. So if you have a loved one who is uh, suffering from dementia but still has guns, um, that's probably an unsafe situation. You should be thinking about, is it safe for them to have a firearm? If you have a loved one who's going through something where um, they're depressed and they're talking about suicidal ideation, maybe we need to temporarily remove their guns until that threat has been abated. And so thinking about it for suicide prevention is something that I try to do public education about now because I think that family members are in the best position to recognize the warning signs like we talked about. The example that actually led to California's implementation of GVROs was Elliot Rogers, the, uh, the shooter in the UCSB mass shooting in Isla Vista. What's important about that story is that his parents and his therapist were both alarmed by things that he was saying and doing in the weeks leading up to the shooting, and in fact, had reported to the Santa Barbara SO four weeks prior to the shooting that they needed to go and do a welfare check. He said something's wrong with him, he's escalating in his conduct, I don't like what he's talking about, he has guns, I don't like it. They actually went out to their credit and they did a welfare check and they knocked on the door. And on the day of their visit, Elliot Roger did not meet the criteria for a 5150 hold. To remind everyone, you have to be a danger of harming self or others due to a mental defect or disorder. And to most cops, that means you need to seem like you're not okay right now. So they knocked on the door and he was fine that day. Hello officer, can I help you? Nothing to see here. There's absolutely no justification to arrest him, to search his house. He's committed no crime. He's not a prohibited person. And he's not acting like a danger to self or others right then. But you have objective evidence in front of you that he was planning to shoot people with a gun. So what do you do? Now you can think GVRO. So last night in the city of San Jose, when I get a call now from the head, uh, the lieutenant over um, the gang and assaults unit, and he says, Marissa, we've got a situation. We have a Facebook threat. We have a guy, 22-year-old, who's online making threats of shooting a middle school with an assault weapon. And we know he's serious because when his friend said, dude, are you serious? He posted a picture of the gun. And um, his friends have uh, been interviewed, and we believe this is a real threat. 
I'm like, you know what to do. He's like, GVRO? I said, make me proud. So um, they did. They got, they got a GVRO. Um, I, that's an ongoing um, case, but um, they're thinking that now. That's the gap we need to fill. Those are the calls where you need to be thinking about this. Only law enforcement can apply for an emergency GVRO, the temporary emergency GVRO. Um, and once served, they can confiscate guns and ammunition immediately. In fact, it says on the form that they shall. They have to give an admonition to the person that they're serving. You shall surrender all weapons within your care, custody, control, or possession to law enforcement. And uh, I'll tell you some st quick stories about that in a minute. Because um, for the most part, they will voluntarily relinquish. But to the extent that they don't, it actually builds in a new provision of the penal code allowing for a search warrant upon refusal to relinquish. So if you go and serve someone and they say, nope, not doing it, this is how I train the police. I'll always say, all right, so you serve them with the order and you say, give me all your guns and they say no. What do you do next? And they're like, handcuffs? I'm like, yes, why? Why, what crime have they committed? And they've committed three crimes actually. They've committed the crime of failure to obey with a, lawfully, uh, with a lawful court order. They've committed uh, 148, which is failure to comply with a lawful order of a peace officer. But they've also committed a new law violation, and this is really important, which was built into the series of laws that were passed with the GVRO. They've now committed the misdemeanor of failure to abide by a GVRO by relinquishing your firearms. And we want them to be thinking of that code section because to the extent that you're convicted of that, you now have a firearms ban built into that misdemeanor. Well, which is important. That was a really smart thing that they did. And so I'm always telling them, make sure to remember mm -hmm. that code section. That's why you always call the DA when you do one of these, so I can remind you of that. Um, so uh, that's been a really important piece of it. The temporary ex parte is for non-emergency situations. However, um, although it's a non-emergency, these are always still going to be dangerous, right? It's still a standard of you are danger to others. Um, it just doesn't have the, the urgency of the EPO form. Um, family members and housemates can apply for that one. The, it will last 21 days until the one-year hearing is held to the extent, whether, um, if a hearing is held. This is what I want to stress to this group. To the extent that you are considering getting one of these, in an emergency, call 911. Do not wait until tomorrow to apply in family court. The process takes some time to then ha call police and go through the process. If it is a true situation where somebody is a danger of using a gun, call the police. And so when Julia said, you know, um, you can obtain one of these as a member of the public, as a family member um, or a housemate, you are now in the eligible category of somebody who can apply, please don't do so if it's unsafe. Call 911. <laughs> so that's my big uh, public disclaimer. Um, please continue to use law enforcement because I will tell you that serving these are dangerous. And that my experience has been that serving them often involves a SWAT team um, because you've now said, as a member of law enforcement, I believe they are armed and I believe they are dangerous. So I'm not just going to send a patrol cop up to knock on the door. That's not safe. <laughs> They're armed and dangerous. It's not safe. So it's also not safe for members of the public to attempt one of these um, under most circumstances. Um, the guns, OK, I want to address this issue. I get this question a lot. Guns who are registered to someone other than the restrained person. So you can imagine that a lot of people that we are restraining don't have guns registered to them. Some of them are minors. So in the school shooting situations, you have 17-year-olds who are threatening to blow up the school or shoot up the school. If we have reason to believe that they have access to firearms that belong to someone else, like their parents, that is something, in an assessment that the police need to make. And to the extent that they actually do possess them, we have to take steps to ensure that they don't have access to them. And so um, you can, in fact, try to get guns removed from someone other than the restrained party. And I've done that. In a case that we did in Los Gatos, it was an adult son living with um, his elderly mother. The mom has all the guns registered to her. So it's kind of like an Adam Lanza situation. The mom, however, has the code to the safe on a post-it on the front of the safe. <laughs> so um, we know that son is a danger. He's been a neighborhood menace. Um, he, in fact, was arrested with one of the mom's guns in his lap um, uh, several days after this. But um, he had posted photos of him with some of the guns on social media and had texted an ex-girlfriend with a bunch of alarming statements with photos of the guns that we knew were mom's guns. So we show mom, are these your guns? And you're like, yes, those are my guns. And we said, you need to give those over because your son, uh, or you need to secure them. And she goes, well, I keep them in a safe. And we said, well, obviously they're not secure because he actually got them. He, and she said, 
I'm not going to cooperate with you. These are my guns. I've done nothing wrong. And we said, you live in a home now with a restrained party. You can face legal ramifications if you do not secure these weapons, and take the post it off the front of the safe, or surrender them to law enforcement to the extent that you're allowing a restrained person access to them. Um, and usually that'll do it. Usually they'll say, okay, I'll lock them up. I will keep them safe. I understand I'm legally obligated, but this mother was not having it. She's like, no, my son, you know, I don't agree with this law. And so we actually did relinquish all of those firearms because he did in fact have actual possession over them. And he is now restrained and he had actual access and the person who was responsible for securing them wouldn't. So um, we need to be thinking about that. And it's part of what the um, officers who serve these need to be doing is making sure we get these guns or secure them. Um, so we've already talked about the longer order. I won't get um, too much more into the weeds about um, the standard other than to say you have to show in an actual hearing by clear and convincing evidence that the subject poses a significant danger to self or others. And the hearing will require live witnesses. Um, and to the extent that you are uh, or someone you know is going to attempt to be a witness or to bring a complaint to law enforcement, you may need to appear for one of these hearings, so please be prepared to do so if that's what's required. Uh, we try not to call witnesses if we can, uh, um, or not to call um, civilians if we can get away with it. We try to use officers, but um, I have had a hearing where I had to call the neighbors who reported the disturbance. I'll give a couple examples quickly and then turn it over to Dean Winslow. Sorry, I'm going as quickly as I can. The first example um, that San Jose actually attempted last year after my big push uh, were a scary text message situation. This is very common, but um, it was a domestic violence situation where, um, oh, no, this one. Okay, this is actually Campbell. Okay, this is very similar to the next one I'm going to do with San Jose, but... DV situation, the wife calls from San Juan Batista. Her husband works in Campbell, and she says, um, listen, I'm a longtime victim of my husband. I've never reported it to law enforcement, and I'm not trying to call for that reason. I'm calling because I think he's going to shoot police officers. He just loaded up the car with all of his guns. He's angry, and um, he's headed to his workplace in Campbell, and he's been texting me. It was the day after um, police officers were killed in Dallas by a sniper, and he was referencing that, saying, turn on the news, I'm going to do worse than that, these pigs better watch out, and then pictures of his guns. And so she's like, I think he's coming to shoot you guys. And so that's when I got the call from the officer being like, look it up, we need one of these. He wasn't restricted, he wasn't prohibited, he had not committed a DV incident that we were aware of, we had no other basis to, restrain, to take guns from this person other than a GVRO. We were super, super happy that that tool existed for that call. We got it and we were able to secure these weapons. There was actually um, a traffic stop was made. Um, he in fact was driving under the influence, which is interesting side fact, mm -hmm. unknown at the time that we stopped him. Um, he was speeding up the freeway and he was stopped for um, by CHP for the violation, found uh, to have this order and um, served with it. And we got eight guns, including two scoped rifles. Um, so that's a success story. Um, so he faced prosecution on a number of bases for that call. Um, so we had a school shooter threat. We had one last night. We get these fairly frequently. Um, but in this particular call, which was the first one I did with San Jose PD, um, suspect got into an argument with his girlfriend. Um, girlfriend then goes home to mom. Mom calls the police. When police arrive, the girlfriend female is denying the domestic violence incident. She's like, nope, 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 he didn't hit me, nothing like that. And the mom says, show him the text messages. Police officers look in the phone and the, um, the boyfriend is saying, the suspect is saying, I have no reason to live. His mom um, was, they were going through some things in his personal life. I have no reason to live. He shows pictures of guns and he says, I'm gonna shoot that place up and she says, He's referring to the school. And the officers, upon a further interview, learn that he was particularly angry. He had been um, on detention a lot, and he was mad at some teachers, and that he had been telling girlfriend in the last week that he wanted to shoot up the school. And um, in his text messages, it was clear that he meant it. And so um, they secured a gun violence restraining order. That one went to a hearing. And this is my favorite example. I think this one is the one that most people... Um, who um, would initiate it on their own might recognize this fact pattern. Um, this was reported to police by a group of neighbors. This was like the neighborhood guy that everyone was afraid of. If you've ever seen the movie Gran Torino, which is why I included up here, it was this guy. So he was like kind of the curmudgeon in the neighborhood. He was a gun enthusiast. He used to um, sit on his porch with his gun in his lap. 
and he used to menacingly look and taunt the neighbors, right? And he had a thing about speeding in the neighborhood. So there was a period in time where he was pointing a radar gun at people who were speeding in the neighborhood. But then um, neighbors were reporting it in that he was pointing a gun at them. So cops had come to the house many times for this guy. Um, and it turned out, no, it wasn't a gun. Well, we all thought you had a gun. Well, it wasn't. It was a radar gun. But he was very menacing. And he would clean his guns in his garage with the door open. On the day of the incident, he runs into the street to yell at speeding kids. During the argument, the, um, so the driver of the car gets out and actually takes this guy on. They get into an argument, and Gran Torino man says, you don't want to mess with me, and then makes a gun hand gesture and then blows the smoke off the end of his gun um, and says, you don't want to mess with me. And so he took it as a threat of he's going to shoot me. We had a full hearing in this case. The whole neighborhood came out to give a statement about various different interactions that they had had with this guy that were scary, threatening, made them believe that he was actually going to use his gun. But the critical component of that hearing is that he took the stand and said, and when questioned, what would you do if a neighbor actually came onto your lawn? He said, oh, I'd shoot him. And by the way, if they speed, I'd shoot him too. And we were like, that does it. So um, he had 34 guns. Oh. 34 guns that were turned over to law enforcement. Uh, so he's subject to a one-year order. So there are some, some examples of how we've used it. And the big issue is that when you go out to serve a guy like this, he was agitated. He was agitated. He was armed. We ran him out, saw he had all these guns registered to him. So we had to serve this with a SWAT team which is not what you want to have roll into the neighborhood, by the way. So thinking about the eventualities and playing out how these actually work, it's a good thing to remember that what we're asking law enforcement to do is always going to be a hot call. It's armed and dangerous. It's, um, it's serious. And so the reason that they haven't been done 158 times in our state is in part because we have other tools that we've been using that close some of that gap, but also because it's hard. It gets really, really hard and dangerous. But we're going to keep doing it because we've got to – Keep the community safe however we can, and it's a great tool. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, our, our final uh, panelist is a real triple threat. Uh, Dean Winslow is a professor of medicine here at Stanford. He's also a retired U.S. Air Force colonel and flight surgeon, uh, deployed six times to Iraq and Afghanistan. And in 2018, he was uh, a co-founder of Scrubs Addressing the Firearm Epidemic, SAFE which unites doctors, nurses, and health care professionals to address gun violence in the U.S. as a public health issue and to advocate for education of health care providers, research, and evidence-based policy to reduce gun violence. Dean. Thanks, Johnny. First of all, you know, thank you so much, and thank you everyone that was involved in organizing this, and it's really an honor to be on the panel. First of all, I'm going to spare you any slides, but this will be really short. Um, and before I forget, though, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the people from SAFE that are here in the audience. Um, again, uh, Dr. Susan McLean uh, and uh, is an internist, Dr. Braz Silver and Mrs. Silver, who's part of our group, and anybody else from SAFE here? Uh, uh, of course, you know, John, you're part of our group as well. And again, so, you know, as you said, that, you know, we started this organization uh, early last year, um, and uh, again, kind of our goal is, is to unite doctors, nurses, other people involved in the healthcare profe profession for what we can do, you know, to help reduce gun violence. And so one of the things that we're focusing on, I can talk more about this in a minute, is really to educate medical students, doctors in training, and already practicing doctors about how to talk to their patients about uh, securing their weapons and other things that can really, um, uh, you know, reduce the, the, the amount of gun violence. Um, I'd like to, though, talk a little bit about something that you had mentioned in your statistics and that of the almost 40,000 people that died of uh, gun violence last year in the United States, two-thirds were suicides. And it's interesting, like some of my buddies who are, you know, former military and, you know, are really into guns and everything, it's almost like there's a, a, an idea that, that, well, that we don't really care about that. And, just as, as someone you know, who's a doctor and, frankly, a Christian, I think that's terrible uh, and that suicide is you know, just, just a horrible thing. Um, I remember when I was commander of the United States Air Force Combat Hospital in Baghdad during the surge in 2008, and you know, it was bad enough as you know, we were fighting 
uh, really heavy combat, both up in Sadr City, which was the Shia slum, kind of in the northeast part of Baghdad, as well as up in Samarra, a number of other places. And so one of my jobs as the hospital commander uh, was to actually, usually between about three and five in the morning, a uh, phone would ring, you know, my, my bunk, uh, w which was right next to the emergency room, and uh, it would be the morgue, uh, the, the uh, uh, casualty receiving facility. And my, my job would, and I did not delegate this as much as I could have to more junior doctors. I wanted them fresh to actually be able to respond to a mass cow in the emergency room. So I would get out of bed, put my flight suit on, put my weapon on, and uh, drive about 400 meters uh, down the flight line to the morgue where the Army uh, Mortuary Affairs soldiers would uh, have me unzip three, four, five, six body bags of uh, soldiers, uh, and sometimes Marines, killed in combat that day. That's the toll. That's what people don't realize when you, you, you call people to war and ask young people to, to do what our country wants to do. But one of the things that really, and that was sad enough, you know, to see America's best young men and women um, uh, after they'd given everything, but just as sad, I think probably five or six times during the six months that I was deployed that time uh, would be one of the body bags I'd be asked to unzip would be someone who killed themselves. And uh, usually it was, again, a soldier uh, or airman, a Marine sometimes. Um, and interestingly, and these, again, these are the suicides that I think are going to be most difficult to prevent, but they were still uh, sad. And the typical story was someone without any history of prior psychiatric disease would get typically a, a Dear John letter or a Dear Jane letter. Do you guys know what that is <coughs> from, from their loved one? Basically, you know, I've left you for someone else or I've drained your bank account. And I think all of us as human beings maybe have had sad things happen in our lives. And I think if we're all honest, probably most of us, there's like the thought went through our head just transiently, huh, I wonder what would happen if I killed myself. You know, would things be better? And most of us, though, like if that, if that happens, that, well, the thought passes, or you pick the phone up and you call one of your buddies, and you go out and you drink a pitcher or two of beer, and, uh, you know, you laugh and cry and thump each other on the back, and you go to bed, and the next morning you wake up, and life's good again, you know? But the problem is, if you've got a loaded 9 millimeter Beretta pistol or your M4 assault rifle right with you, and, you know, it's... You know, we're required to, to, to be armed all the time when you're in a war zone. It's awful easy, I think, probably in that situation to go from that transient thought of, well, what would happen if I just pulled the trigger to actually pulling the trigger? And so that was the story that I got with the probably six or seven uh, suicides that I, that I pronounced uh, in Iraq that year. But anyway, shifting gears, again, as you mentioned, I'm a veteran myself. And um, so I think it's approximately 20... Um, Veterans kill each other every day in the United States, you know, they die by suicide. And I think of that, probably 15 or 16 are by firearms, and the rest are opioids, which is a whole other issue. Um, so I think we've got to do a better job in getting guns out of the hands of people who are at risk, not just for homicide, like you've talked about, and mass shootings, although that's really horrible, but um, also out of the hands of people who really just shouldn't have them. You know, again, people with dementia, um, people with severe depression, uh, people who've made suicidal threats. But as you can see from both Julia's presentation and Marissa's presentation, there are a lot of barriers. And also, it's just the speed at which you can do it. And again, you know, we have this need appropriately in the United States for due process and everything. But one of the real challenges, I think, of firearms is just that, that you know, you can kill yourself so fast or you can kill other people so fast and just like you know that case of the recent shooting down in Santa Barbara where there were all those warning signs and even there had been attempts made to remove this young young person's guns um, it wasn't good enough so I think all of us just as lawyers as concerned citizens and doctors need to uh, need to redouble our efforts to try to come to some type of a solution and, you know, again, I, I'm a big believer in not just the Second Amendment, but also the First Amendment and all the other amendments mm -hmm. to the Constitution. And, uh, 
but I think that there are ways that we can do it. And again, I'm not going to bore you with our slides, but I, you know, kind of just basic outlines of what I've proposed to people is that you regulate guns a little bit like the way we do uh, airplanes. And that, um, you know, I've long thought that, um, uh, you know, I've been a pilot since I was 14 years old. Well, just to be a you know, exercise the privileges of a private pilot. I have to go to a doctor every two years and have a very thorough physical exam, and they at least do a kind of some type of effort to make sure I'm not crazy, you know, or they won't issue me a, you know, a medical certificate. Also, I have to go up with a, uh, with an instructor or uh, uh, actually even a designated FAA examiner every two years to make sure that I'm still safe and competent, you know, to operate this aircraft. and. Uh, again, you know, something I think that having similar requirements at some point for gun ownership uh, would be really helpful. And it's really interesting. I was on this panel just this last weekend down at the Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Saratoga, and the person next to me is actually an NRA firearms instructor, and uh, he's all for that. Uh, uh, you know, so it's not like that the you know NRA members actually really support more universal background checks. I think they would probably support most of the legal remedies that, you know, the three of you have talked about during this panel, as, as well as uh, maybe some of these other things. Uh, but anyway, going back to SAFE, and I'll close, is just that uh, we, uh, we did start this organization. We had this nationwide event on September 17th where 42 medical schools, in addition to Stanford, have chapters and medical students all came outside at noon, usually, and and uh, they had basically a, like a very peaceful, uh, I wouldn't call it a demonstration, but an awareness event. Everyone wore matching scrubs that uh, uh, we, we had supplied uh, to all the students. And we're hoping uh, probably in early April, um, we've actually been in touch with uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, as well as uh, Jackie Spear, who herself was a victim of gun violence uh, many years ago, if you remember the Jonestown um, massacre. Um, uh, we're going to actually be having a, uh, a day-long sort of lobbying day at, um, with uh, so hopefully we'll have two doctors and medical students from every state in the union to actually go into their own representatives and senators' offices and, and, and uh, advocate for uh, common sense uh, you know, gun violence uh, prevention. And then just the last thing, just to maybe end up on a lighter note. Um, so. Um, uh, Marissa was asking me a little bit about kind of how it came to this, and, and uh, uh, I, I was actually asked by Jim Mattis to be his Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, and I had what could be called a disastrous hearing in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and I won't bore you with all the details, but Senator McCain yelled at me three different times uh, <laughs> during the hearing. The last one was actually in response to Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire, who had this was the day after the terrible Sutherland Springs mass shooting where this Air Force veteran had uh, shot up this church and killed 26 men, women, and children in a house of worship. And this is the, the, the day after uh, uh, this was, was my hearing, and I was pretty upset about it, and I hadn't really thought much about gun violence, but then Senator Shaheen uh, was kind of showboating for her constituency, and, and she didn't even call me Dr. Winslow. She called me Colonel Winslow, even though I'd been retired for a couple of years. Like, what are you going to do? Why does this veteran, you know, receive a bad conduct rather than a dishonorable discharge? And I said, well, ma'am, you know, that's not a medical issue. That's really a, a JAG issue. And she said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, well, I, if I'm confirmed to this position, I'd ask Secretary Mattis to uh, convene an IG inspection to look into root cause. And I, and I should have stopped there. Uh, but I'd be at the Pentagon now, but I couldn't resist, and I said that as a flight surgeon who was trained to investigate fatal aircraft mishaps, that every mishap I investigated, there was always a chain of events, and if you'd interrupted any link in the chain, the tragedy wouldn't have happened. And I said, in a case like this terrible mass shooting that happened yesterday, you have to look at the first obvious link in the chain is like, why do we allow civilians access to assault rifles in the U.S.? <laughs> at that point, McCain yelled at me the third time and he said, Dr. Winslow, that's not in your area of responsibility or authority. And that was, of course, before the in our lane thing. I wish, you know, thing. But, but anyway, I don't mean to make fun of it. But, but the bottom line is, is that I really believe that, you know, I'm not too many more years before hopefully I'll join John McCain in heaven 
and and we I, I've heard that they have just this amazing officers club in a bar in heaven. <laughs> but McCain owes me three drinks for each time he yelled at me. So, <laughs> well, thank you, Dean. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, be a, a member of, uh, of SAFE, even though I'm not a doctor, but my mom always wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> this way I'm sort of uh, paying tribute. Um, so I just wanted to start off with a question, and if people do have questions, come down and uh, line up behind the two microphones that we have here. Uh, but I thought I'd begin just by following up on Marissa's statement about the individual we were referring to as the Gran Torino man. Uh, because I think you mentioned that uh, an order was given to take away his guns for a year. Yes. And so what happens afterwards? Uh, can, can you tell us about next steps for potentially? Yes. Um, so I'll add two facts to that fact pattern. So the first is um, after the year, um, you can apply to do it again. You can apply for another year-long extension. He's subject to judicial review every single year. So to the extent, I told the neighbors, to the extent that you think he is an ongoing danger, you need to bring this hearing all over again because um, the temporary emergency order and the temporary order only last 21 days and the order after hearing only lasts a year, but you can keep getting them year after year if the danger continues. Um, but what I will say also that is important and I think underscores some of the gap and why we need a GVRO for this particular example is that um, San Jose PD had referred this particular gentleman to the hospital on a 5150 hold two months prior to our coming out and eventually doing a GVRO. So you may wonder, well, how come he wasn't prohibited? And the reason for that is because a referral by the police department on a 5150 does not trigger a prohibition on its own. You have to actually be held by the hospital and admitted under 5150. And unfortunately in our county, and I suspect in many counties around the state, there is limited bed space for people to take those beds. And so they're not gonna take everybody who's brought in by the police department. That would be way too many people. They encounter a lot of folks who are um, demanding and potentially deserving of that bed space for evaluation for 72 hours, but they do not hold everyone. And in fact, in our county, um, very frequently they turn people away. And so in this particular instance, the police believed he was a 5150 appropriate referral. He was not admitted. He would not have been prohibited. So I tell police officers all the time, 5150 and, and GVRO have a ton of overlap, but 5150 and GVRO are not the same. So if you believe that one or both apply, get both, get both. There's no harm in getting both, the standard is met. So um, in this particular case, they should have done both and he would have been prohibited um, had there been a firearms uh, risk at his original 5150 referral. So I think it's an important learning example from him. And, and if I could just build on that a little bit, um, one of the reasons you need to, the court needs to be running the check, even if they're at the end of it and someone comes back or at any point, is because there may be other reasons that they're prohibited. So they don't have to just turn them over. Before they turn the firearms over at the end of that year, there should also be a check to find out if they are otherwise prohibited. And often they will be, yeah. we think. Yeah. Um, before we turn to our question, just one more follow-up. So uh, a police officer shows up with the GVR form mm -hmm. saying, you have an order to turn over your guns, and they turn over 27 guns. Yes. Um, how do we know we, we got all of the guns? This is a super important question. Mm -hmm. So first you need to run them to see what it's registered to them. That's the first uh, checking point. So um, let's say that this guy only had 25 guns. So now you just got two bonus guns, good for you. But you suspect that there are more guns inside the house. This happened to us a couple weeks ago in Palo Alto. Um, and we, um, he had zero guns registered to him in Cal DOJ, uh, but we knew based on the photographs and other evidence in the case that he had at a minimum a shotgun um, and a modified AR. And so we were like, where are they? And so we said to him, where's the shotgun? He's like, one shotgun. We said, this shotgun right here, where is it? And he's like, oh, okay. But um, to the extent uh, that you don't have any other independent evidence, um, you uh, really need to do a thorough investigation to figure out, do you have all the guns that we are aware of in law enforcement? To the extent that they, he had not relinquished, he, had, he did voluntarily, but let's change the fact pattern and say, you have reason to believe he has a shotgun and a rifle that he has not relinquished. You now have probable cause to search his home. 
because he is now in violation of the GVRO and you have now triggered 1524A21, which is the new search warrant section that allows you to get into the house upon probable cause of failure to relinquish. So go hit, hit the house and see what you find. But you don't have that automatically. And I meant to mention this earlier. A gun violence restraining order does not on its own allow you the basis to search a home. They have to fail to relinquish before you can get inside the house. It also is not an independent basis to arrest. So if you get a gun violence restraining order and nothing else, you can't just go arrest somebody because you've obtained an order. It's not, a, it's not an arrest warrant. And um, so very often it is associated with an arrest because of the way that it was served or executed and other things that happen, but it is not an arrest warrant. So um, that's important to know going in. And, and this is why I, I would sort of reaffirm Dean's position that it really is valuable to have gun registration for exactly this reason. If you yes. have an order to go get the guns and you don't know how many guns there are, it really undermines the effectiveness, which makes me concerned that my former student Brett Kavanaugh in his oh, one yeah. gun decision on the DC circuit said that registration was an impermissible act under the Second Amendment. So that's a concern. But let's turn to our audience. Um, I have a question about, I was reading about GVRO, and I was reading that one of the, if it's served by a family member, uh, the person that is served uh, doesn't have to immediately uh, give up the, ar the arms there are also, there's also the possibility of selling to uh, a federally, um, you know, gun, gun uh, store, <laughs> dealer, or uh, give it to a, a dealer for keeping as long as is possible. But um, I think it's 24 hours or 48 hours, right? Isn't that a little weakness of the <laughs> GVRO? Because the person basically uh, has 24 hours or 48 hours, and usually the, the people that do get this order are not totally happy about it. Yes. Maybe. Do you want to address that, Julie? Sure. I mean, I'll start, and, and you can certainly build on it. But the, um, so first of all, it's recommended, and it's free. Uh, it's recommended that you have law enforcement serve the order. So even if you're a family member who seeks the order, requests the order, obtains the order, you can have law enforcement serve that order for free. Now, you have to figure that out in your jurisdiction, how to make that happen. But you can contact law enforcement and request that they serve the order. The reason we think, and we don't have any appellate cases on this yet in California, but the way the statute's structured is that law enforcement must request when they serve the order, that the firearms be turned over to them, that the person surrender their firearms safely. They're the only ones that can have it right away. But, but, but safely. And safely might mean, we were just with some law enforcement earlier today, putting, you know, someone says, okay, look, wait, let me go get my assault weapons, right? Putting them in handcuffs, you know, freezing the scene, maintaining a safe environment so that they can obtain the firearms appropriately, right? They can seize them. Not a search warrant, but they can seize them. Um, you're a family member, you serve the order, for you to say, give me all your assault weapons right now, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It's not gonna be, you're not able to secure the scene in the same way. So when it's served by someone other than law enforcement, they have 24 hours to safely relinquish them by calling the police department and saying, I have a bunch of firearms or one firearm, whatever, and I'm gonna come over and I'm gonna you know, wanna walk into a police department with firearms you have to have a local protocol for that to happen. So the safest way is for fi for uh, law enforcement to be serving that order, right? Okay, so, so law enforcement I, serves yeah. the order. That's why that 24 hours, you're absolutely right. It's a very dangerous period. I don't want them to be waiting that 24 so hours. The police can do it right away, right? They can serve it, they right? Even it if right it's away. they're not but pursuing But do they it. have also the right to tell the person that they, they also have the 24 hours? or? The, when the police serve, they don't have to disclosure that. So the, so the question is, do, yeah. do the police have the ability to take the guns right away, yes, or yes. must they wait? They, they must request them, yeah. that they surrender them. They must ask them. The police are required to do that, and that person is required to turn them over. Yeah, but I've certainly the, seen cases. But in the law, there is also that they can wait 24 hours or 48, right? The they have the choice, or the other two choices I was do. talking about, right? So is that the police has to 
tell the person, you know, the person that received the order that they also have that choice or it's not required by law? They don't have to tell them about the choice. Okay. <laughs> oh. But it is, in fact, like if the person were schooled up on it and they said to the officer, I have 48 hours to be able to try and sell this to a gun dealer. I'm going to exercise that right right now. They would be absolutely correct in stating that. Um, so or if it's you, in another location. So for your experience, it, that is a weakness of the law, right? Yes. I mean, in a way. Okay. Yes. I don't know why it was crafted like that. Well, I'm sure so there was a reason. Yeah, let me just say this. So if you say to them, you're the police officer, you serve it, and you say, I'm now required to tell you, turn over your firearms to me. Mm -hmm. And that person says no, you can argue they're in violation and they can be arrested on the spot for being in violation of the order because the restriction issues as soon as the order is issued. Yep. Right? Yep. So while they might have 24 hours, they've already violated the order. If they have them on their person, you know, right. you're going to have an easier Because case people don't make. know about GVRO. They're, they're, they're ignorant. But once they will know, they will know that they have 24 hours and 48 hours. And they will tell the, the police person, hey, I have 24 hours and 48 hours. Also, the the statute okay. says uh, if law enforcement, sorry. if there's no request. If there's no request, it can only be because a family member served them or a, somebody else served them, uh, not a family, but a, a non-law enforcement person served them because there will always be a request if law enforcement follows the law, yep. because law enforcement must request it. Do you see what I'm saying? It's so an obscure loophole that only yes. applies in the narrowest of circumstances. And so one of the circumstances that Julia was mentioning a moment ago that actually does come up from time to time is if the firearms aren't on the premise, but they're registered to you and we know you have them. So like we're serving you at home, but we know that you also keep them at your garage across town. Like, where are the rest of your guns? And you say, oh, they're over there. Okay, well, you know, we're not going to drive with you across town necessarily, although I would recommend that to law enforcement um, if you really believe this person is a danger and they're not going to jail that night if they remain out of custody or something like that. Um, but that is a circumstance where you may run into that. We ha haven't had that, though, yet. I was very confused about it because I thought there was – you know. Okay, let's, let's take one more question here. Yeah. So my question is about the evidence. In the examples you gave us, it was very convenient. I'm texting, telling you that I'm going to hurt someone with my guns, right? Or I've, I've conveniently posted that. And in other situations, people may not have that clear evidence. They may have heard verbal conversations. They may know that their, their relative has a gun. So it's not as, as easy just to bring it and have a police officer go out. So kind of two questions. One is, what other evidence can people provide in those situations, and how will the DA or the police department work with family members who are going, holy crap, I don't have the convenient, I'm going to kill you in a text message or post on social media, but these were the words I heard. That's an A plus, but an A is any statement of the restrained party. So uh, the statement of the restrained party is the most important evidence that we have to support their state of mind, their dangerousness. So any threats, veiled or otherwise, or expressed that have been made to anyone who can provide competent evidence to a police officer will go into the police report that uh, you know accompanies your GVRO. And um, that's another reason why we highly recommend that you employ the services of law enforcement where appropriate because they'll take a police report and they'll interview you and they'll get a background and they'll say, you know, have there been prior instances like this? Is there, um, you know, tell me any instances where they've made statements about using their gun. Um, and it doesn't need to be commemorated in a text message. These are my, these are my favorite examples because they were so extreme. Uh, but in the case of the naughty neighbor, I mean, we had witness after witness after witness who came forward and were like, this one time when we were in the neighborhood, and they just gave um, statements of the defendant, and they were incredibly compelling. So it's every bit as strong. Uh, still an A. Can I just make one quick observation? That if there's part of this law that you think needs tweaking or whatever, you have until the 24th. First, I think it's the 21st of February, to put in a spot uh, for a, a um, assemblyman or a, uh, a state senator to put a spot order in for a law, to, and they fill in the details afterwards. So now is the time. Thank I would, you. And just to add to that, the Judicial Council forms um, are out for comment. If you look at the forms and you think the forms should be uh, worded differently, or anything is missing, if you don't like the forms, it's a very democratic process, um, and they are taking comments. So I have 
uh, the forms up here with the request for comment. And um, you can provide that kind of information to Christy um, Morioka, who is the person who's taking comments. So similarly, you can change how GVROs are handled by um, influencing the forms that are used. And thank you for that reminder, because last year I actually, um, with Senator Skinner, we testified uh, with Giffords, actually, to make some important amendments to the GVRO law, which were passed. So we, um, it, the littlest of tweaks can be significant in big cases. So thank you. So I just had one quick question. Uh, on the slide, I put the comments of the killer of, uh, at Parkland a year ago uh, before he went on his rampage. He posted... I am nothing, I am no one, my life is nothing and meaningless. With the power of the AR, you will know who I am. Uh, would this be enough to trigger? Oh, yeah. Yes. What we say is you should always take a person at their word. It's better safe than sorry. This is a better safe than sorry tool. If somebody is posting in a public forum that they intend to harm someone with a gun, take them seriously. If it turns out that they were just messing around, they can explain that at the to the judge at their 21-day hearing. But for a period of 21 days, we will take you seriously. So. Well, and the law, can I just uh, quickly, I'll go through the, the penal code because the judge must consider certain factors, including a recent threat of violence or act of violence by the respondent towards another or him or herself, which we've talked about, a violation of a domestic violence emergency protective order that's in effect, that must be considered, a recent within six month violation of an unexpired domestic violence protective order, any conviction for any crime that prohibits purchase and possession of firearms, and a pattern of violent acts or threats within the past 12 months, and they may consider unlawful and reckless use, display, or brandishing of the firearm, um, and a list of other things, prior arrest. So we have built in several factors that should be drawing the court's attention to a number of different issues and provide some guidance for people who are t uh, trying to obtain these orders. Okay, yeah. Assemblyman Phil Ting of San Francisco submitted last year a bill that would widen the circle of people who could apply for a GVRO and Governor Brown did not sign it. He's going to resubmit it. <coughs> who would you like to see included in this wider circle of people who could apply for a GVRO? It has been resubmitted already. And he's including? Uh, school employees. Uh, yeah, so school employees. School employees, and I, I think perhaps and fellow, 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 yeah. fellow workplace workers. Yeah, yeah. workers, like your fellow employees. Anyone else you think? I mean, my, and I'm not speaking necessarily on behalf of Giffords here, right? But I just want to say that I continue to believe that it makes a lot more sense to contact law enforcement. And anyone can contact law enforcement regardless of the relationship, because law enforcement has a certain amount of credibility. Law enforcement has the protocols and the resources to um, handle seizure and relinquishment appropriately. So I, I don't know that we have enough information yet about expanding the pool of non-law enforcement people and how effective that is. I, don't, I just don't know yet. So I'm not focused on that so much as I am on implementing what we do have and figuring out how it might work. So I, I, I'm not opposed to it, and neither is Giffords, you know, and I can see a lot of value in it, especially when people are concerned about contacting law enforcement when they have family members who might be mentally ill and um, other communities that are concerned about police misconduct or don't want to call the police into their family, right? That's a real issue in our communities right now. So in which case you think, well, that's great, let's have but I'd like to keep some indicia of credibility and familiarity with the person, not just anyone because there's potential for abuses. So I'm less focused right now on expanding, and I would like anybody to be able to go to law enforcement and ask yeah. law enforcement uh, to do it. So that's my sense Because the public has so rarely applied for these, um, where I'm really, I think Julie and I probably agree on this, is that 
Um, as we have more um, experience with public requests and um, you know family members applying for these, and I think where we really have the unmined potential here is in suicide pre prevention. Our biggest audience for this tool for the public is nobody knows better the warning signs of somebody who's despondent. Like you're not going to call a police officer out to your house on a 911 call because your husband's been talking like he's depressed lately and he's having suicidal ideations or he's you know has dementia and it's not appropriate for him to be conserved but it's probably not appropriate for him to have a gun and so in that instance you wouldn't want to call the police out to your house but you would want to alert a court that like i need some assistance in removing these guns and i don't want him to go behind my back and go buy one at bass pro shops tomorrow when i'm not looking mm -hmm. and so that is a place where i really feel that a lot of public advocacy is um it is uh, um, gonna be helpful to us in law enforcement is to educate the difference between a 911 call GVRO and a public GVRO where it is most appropriate for those close to them to notice the warning signs and to go to a judge to initiate this process as opposed to going to a police officer to initiate the process. And that's gonna be a totally different realm that I haven't had that much experience with because I'm always on the cop end of things. But I can see that if we start to use it through groups like this and you start to spread the word through Moms Demand Action and other groups that deal in this and communicate with the public of how the public can use it, we're gonna be so much better prepared to know what's effective. So, yeah. So maybe in a year from now when we've done a lot more. <laughs> One, one, one problem is that in the American gun culture, you get things like this. Again, this was the Parkland shooter who uh, posted this, uh, where people think of the guns as the mental health therapy, and that is sort of a dangerous message. No. My question was very similar to the earlier one in the sense of that it was something like whether expanding the number of people who could like file the uh, GVROs was helpful, but what other loopholes are there in the current laws that you think um, should be reformed, especially like considering, like you said earlier, like mental health and like the overlap of the 50s and the 50s to make sure that people who kind of fall in those gray spaces get access to them. On the GVROs, I don't know right now that um, I think we need to tweak the tool as much as I think we need to educate the stakeholders and community members about how to use it. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that I have any horror stories or examples where I'm like, if only, um, we'll try and fix it because I will say there's a genuine um, uh, appetite for this advocacy to fix it. So, you know, the senators and assembly members have been so great about what do you need? Do you want us to, you know, make amendments? So um, if I see if I say, see something, I'll say something. But I can't think of anything right now other than we really, really need to reach as many people as possible to alert them to how to use it and when. I'd say we have some bills right now that identify some areas where um, some loopholes or gaps, which include developing local protocols within law enforcement and doing, I think, having those local protocols developed in conjunction with courts, for example. So we're not going to have consistency until we have more local protocols. So I think that's really important. And I think training, mandating training um, is really important too for courts, for uh, law enforcement, and so forth. And I also think eventually we'll get to a point where we'll be talking more about confidential information in these files, mental health information that is exposed in the public nature of GVROs. So I'd like to be thinking about that in the future. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, I, I think the idea that um, uh, when, when we, if, if we are concerned about folks, why aren't we getting them services? And there are no services connected to a GVRO. So if somebody's in crisis, um, I would like to see, ideally, if we had enough money, resources, and opportunity to change policy, connect the GVRO to some kind of expectation about services so that people get help through that crisis. Okay. Very, very quickly. Uh, are there other, like, uh, other restraining orders that do provide those services? Like, like the yes. Yeah, you can get services in some of the other restraining orders. You can order people to participate in services. Okay, maybe we can just get the last two questions uh, out on the table and then we'll, we'll answer. So do you wanna start? Uh, yes, I was actually just gonna follow up on Professor Donahue's first comment, which was the one year. It seems awfully burdensome to go back year after year to, to re-go to a hearing before you serve back up 27 guns on someone who's already um, proven themselves dangerous. 
Uh, my follow-up was after the Las Vegas mass murder, uh, the hotels put into effect that uh, staff has to go in and check on the rooms, I think, once every 24 hours. I was attending a hacker conference there this past year as they were trying to enforce this. Now, let's just say it got interesting with people who said they were from the, hosp uh, the hotel that couldn't be identified, banging on women's doors saying, let us in. Uh, those of us in cybersecurity, especially females who attend these conferences, we're going to be the last ones to open these doors. You mentioned that there are opportunities to do additional training. You're obviously doing a wonderful job with the police officers. Are there plans in place to train some of these other folks to help direct these so there isn't the misguidance that could potentially happen? Love that question because the answer is no, but there should be. <laughs> no, there's no plan in place to even train the police. In many neighboring counties and many jurisdictions, the, to the extent I haven't reached the cops in our county, they don't even know about it. Um, you know, there's, there's no mandated training, and I absolutely love hearing from Julia that there's some um, work being done uh, by Giffords uh, and others to try and um, mandate that because, yeah, I mean, this is a tool that comes with some pretty – hefty action. You're going to be deploying police officers to go um, take action. And so um, I feel this not just in the context of GVROs, but um, my law uh, enforcement education campaign was gun laws more broadly because we have more gun laws on the books um, than just about anywhere, but they're ever changing and they're complicated. And if you've ever tried to read the penal code surrounding guns, I was just telling Dean yeah, Winslow, yeah. they're like nesting dolls that refer back. It's very complicated. Um, and so, um, yeah, there should be investment on the back end to educate and train. There should also be investment to deploy. You know, who's gonna do this? Do you have a team in place to go do this relinquishment? Do you have a team in place to do the service? You know, really, if, if we want to use these tools, we got to equip the, the people who are going to do it. Um, you know, if we're going to ask schools to do it, give them the resources to do it. If we're going to ask cops to do it, give them the resources to do it, because otherwise we're doing a ticky-tack job on very, very serious cases, and it's not the best. <laughs> so in, and the question um, about the one-year restraining order, I just want to go back to that since we got them both out. Um, so the, the thing to know about GVROs is it's supposed to be a temporary measure for somebody in crisis. It is not the solution long term. Somebody who continues to be dangerous um, may be appropriate for some of the other criminal or civil remedies. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yes, you can go back and go back and go back, but again, it, you know, the idea is it's temporary, it's for a crisis period. I would also say in terms of training, one of the most recent changes for mandatory training is for uh, in domestic violence is for hairdressers. So if you are going to get your uh, beautician license, your license as a hairdresser, you have to go to domestic violence training because it turns out people who are getting their hair done, women generally, will tell their hairdresser. So they needed to train hairdressers. So we have to think about it. who finds out about what's going on, who do people confide in, and then train them about all of the tools that are available. So I do think it's worth expanding um, to think about who else needs to have the information. Okay, um, our, our speakers will be up here if you do have additional questions, but I'd like you to join, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you, Thank you very much.